I am a lawyer. I don't practice law anymore, but I am still qualified as a lawyer. Before too many people drop off this chat, I want to tell you a story. The first half of my legal career was spent in Toronto, Canada, where I'm from, doing corporate commercial and environmental law in a very big Canadian law firm. The second half of my legal career was spent here, where I am now, just outside Geneva, Switzerland. I worked for almost 18 years in the United Nations system. And the first place that I worked in the UN was a commission called the United Nations Compensation Commission. This commission was set up after the Gulf War. Some of you may remember when Iraq invaded Kuwait, they blew up the oil wells, there was a lot of fires, there was oil dumped in the Gulf. I was head of the team of legal and scientific experts looking at claims from the countries in the region for billions of dollars of damage to the environment and to public health. We would receive the claims, we would receive Iraq's arguments, we would look at them and we would evaluate whether they were founded or not, present them to a tribunal for their decision. It was a fascinating experience for many reasons, but for me perhaps the most fascinating thing of all was the fact that I got to travel extensively throughout the Middle East. I went on almost 20 missions for the UN. Now, a little bit about UN terminology. We don't go on business trips in the United Nations. We say we go on mission. So yes, it sounds like Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible, but in fact, it's much cooler than that. We went on 20 missions to throughout the Middle East, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and perhaps the most fascinating of all for me was Iran. The chance to go to Iran was something that I'd always dreamed of doing, but it's not the easiest place to get to for a variety of reasons. But in 2003, I went for the first time and I was thrilled. I was so excited. Not all of my family members and friends back in Canada shared that same level of excitement. I would get emails and calls saying, Iran, are you going to go to Iran? Is it safe? Are you going to be okay? What about the people? It's because they had formed impressions of the country based on what they saw on TV. But I was all, I was in 100% ready to go. It was a very big mission. There were 18 of us and legal and scientific experts. And I was the senior member from the UN leading this mission. So I was deemed head of mission. And head of mission has a number of responsibilities. One of them is to make opening remarks at the opening plenary session. So the plan was we would all go to Tehran for two days, then we would break into three groups. One group went west, another southeast, my group went south, but for two days we were gonna to be together with our Iranian counterparts in Tehran. So I practiced uh, a lot. I worked on my speech, my opening remarks, to welcome to thank the Iranian hosts for having us, but also to set out what our objectives were, how we saw the whole eight days in Iran, how that would go, things like that. So I practiced and practiced, but one thing that I felt very strongly about was that I wanted to make some opening remarks in Farsi. As a native English speaker, I think it's something that every native English speaker should attempt to do to learn at least a few words in the local language as a sign of respect. So one of my colleagues was from Iran, Mushtaba, and I wrote out two paragraphs in English and I asked him if he could translate them for me and then help me practice saying them correctly. So Mushtaba did that and we worked. I worked on practicing. Once I understood the pronunciation, I worked at it, worked at it, worked at it. And just before I went to Iran, I sat with Mushtaba and I gave my opening remarks in Farsi to him. And I asked him, I said, can you understand me? And he said, yes, your, your pronunciation is very good, John. He said, and, but it's very interesting. Your accent makes you sound like you're from Afghanistan. Because in Afghanistan, Western Afghanistan, they speak Farsi as well. I understand it's a very distinct accent. I, the closest analogy that I can come from being from Canada, when I speak English, many people think I'm American. Mais quand je parle français, là, des gens disent non, il est Canadien. Something like that. So off we went and first day came, big session, big room, 100 people at least, senior members of the Iranian government were there. You could feel 
everybody was very polite, but there was tension in the air. There was a lot at stake. Big picture of the Ayatollah Khomeini behind me. It was like something out of a movie. My Iranian host, he made the opening remarks and then he gave the microphone to me. And I gave my remarks in Farsi and at the end of it, I got a very nice applause. I, I expected that, I, they really appreciated that I said something in Farsi. As they were applauding, I started to think, should I tell them about my accent or not? Should I say it or not? Should I say it or not? This is a big UN mission, should I say it? Eventually, I had the, the applause died down and I thought, what the hell, why not? So I said, I'm glad you were able to understand my remarks because my colleague Mushtaba back in Geneva, he said my accent made me sound like I'm from Afghanistan. There was a second of silence and then the entire room burst into laughter. I mean, huge laughter. It was an amazing response. I was thinking, they laughed so hard, I was thinking, I might have a second career as a stand-up comedian in Iran. And you could feel the tension just kind of die down. And it was a hard meeting and it was a lot of work, but it really set a nice tone. And our hosts were nothing but gracious and hospitable. And as I traveled throughout the country in the evenings, I would go out on my own and I would meet people who didn't know anything about me. And they were equally as hospitable and gracious and curious. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. But it was an experience that was, for me, it was bittersweet for two reasons. First, I knew that most people from the West would never get to see this side of Iran. They would only see what was shown to them by politicians or on the news. The second reason was that in Iran, the same thing happened with people there, because sometimes in my hotel room at night, I would turn on the TV just to get a sense of what was on Iranian TV. And even though I couldn't speak the language, at the end of each program day, they always showed, the government channels always showed scenes from the United States of homeless people sleeping on the streets, people doing drugs in bathrooms, public bathrooms, gang fights, giving an impression that this was how things were in America. And of course, there are problems in America and there are problems in Iran, but the problems are, are small compared to what we share in common. Yes, we have differences, but what we have in common is much more important. And as we sit here today, tonight, about almost a hundred of us all over the world in our rooms, what I'm most afraid of is that, and you see some of this starting, finger pointing, not just between the West and Iran, but many, many different ways, countries pointing fingers at each other and this, this urge to go into isolation. And my message is that, yes, we all have problems and we all have differences, but don't believe everything you see on TV because the truth is that we have much more in common.